All right. Well, welcome back to Context and Clarity Live. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new time. It's a brand new look, and it's a brand new co-host. So um, thank you for joining us here Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. It's going to take me probably a year and a half to remember that. <laughs> but, uh, but welcome to Context and Clarity Live, and a special welcome to Katie Congas. Welcome. Hi. Uh, Glad that you are here as our uh, as our new co-host, uh, joining us all the way from Minnesota, right? Correct. I'm just north of the Twin Cities. Okay. And so, what what do you do? What do you do in the in north of the Twin Cities in Minnesota? Well, I've got uh, so Katie Kangas, yes. Long A's. Um, I started my own firm three years ago and focus on historic preservation and do a little residential on the side. But I've had the delight of working on a historic house that became a museum, the largest archive of a local historical society. And that was very fun. Um, but also on the side, I've been an entree architect fan for 10 years. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah, just following everything. Love learning about business, love talking to people about how they practice architecture and helping people find their their best practice. Awesome, love it. And um, some of you are familiar with the Context and Clarity Classroom, and uh, Katie has been a regular in the Context and Clarity Classroom, and uh, that's been a lot of fun. We've been, we've talked a lot of talked about a lot of great uh, topics, business topics, of course, because it's Entree Architect, and um, so it's great to it's great to make this connection and, and welcome you as uh, as our new co-host in this relaunch of. Uh, Context and Clarity Live. So glad that you're here. Well, and I'm really excited to talk with Toby today because <laughs> Supersizing Bliss sounds like a terrific read and it sounds like he's got a pretty comprehensive practice to go along with it. He does. And, and the two of you were talking uh, backstage before we got started. And so we've got to revisit that conversation because I think there's going to be uh, there's a nice, nice little tie in there. And I think there's uh, going to be a lot of interest in, uh, in what the two of you are talking about too. So we'll introduce Toby in just a minute. I wanna say hello to Leslie. She's joining us from uh, from YouTube, it looks like. She's the first in the room, which we'll go back to our context and clarity tradition. She's the winner of today's Crocheted Bathtub Award. So congrats, uh, congrats Leslie. And uh, I see John Jones over on Facebook and Mark R. LePage. Welcome, glad you are here. It's good to be back, Bob Havian. Glad to have you joining us from LinkedIn today. Um, Arturo is joining us from Facebook as well. Janine uh, is in Arizona. Arturo is in San Diego. Let me see if I can remember these. John Jones is in Connecticut. Uh, Bob, I think, is in California. I'm not 100% sure about that. Mark's in North Carolina. Leslie, I'm guessing, is in South Florida today. Uh, but welcome to all of you. Erica, welcome back from New Jersey. Um, Bob's in Rockland, California. So glad all of you are here uh, if if you are, and, and, you know, we used to say this all the time because this is this is a deal, right? This is a if if you are on Facebook and you're typing away and you go, hey, why are my comments not showing up on the screen? Well, you can blame Mark Zuckerberg for that, but the reality is, it's because you are in a, a closed Facebook group and there are rules, and you know, we abide by rules most of the time. Um, it, those rules say that your name, your likeness, your comments can't come out of that group unless you give permission. So if you go to the URL that is at the bottom left of your screen, open up a different tab, uh, type chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook. If you type that in to the uh, your browser there, a couple of clicks later, you will give uh, Facebook permission to talk to Restream, which is this platform that we use. And I will remind you that those permissions do expire at some point. So if you say, hey, I've done that before, you know, try it again um, and uh, see if that doesn't work out for you. But uh, chat.restream.io slash FB is the key to uh, solving solving those problems. Uh, you know, backing off of solving all the problems in the world a little bit, but uh, it'll solve a lot of problems. So chat.restream.io slash FB. Um, okay. So we've met Katie. We've, you know, we've got the new look going on. We'll figure things out as we go forward here in, on uh, Context and Clarity Live. Some of you have already already know who is in in the green room right now. So why don't I just introduce him? Um, our guest today is an architect, 
and he's a mischief maker. You're going to need to go over to YouTube to figure, or, or you can find it on Instagram and, and uh, TikTok as well, but go over to YouTube and figure out why he is a mischief maker. We'll talk more about that. He designs modern and energy efficient homes that are meant to bring happiness to their inhabitants. He's also the author of Supersizing Bliss, how we have betrayed our homes and the happiness that we seek. Toby Vitt, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's what great, great to intro. have you. <laughs> it's, it's all about you. So I'm sure I butchered your name. Can, can you tell us who you are? <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, pretty pretty good. Well, I go by Toby simply because you know I'm uh, from Germany or originally, and so um, Tobias Tobias is actually my real name, but I couldn't handle the American pronunciation, so I went with Toby. So my last name is Fair Game. It's technically <laughs> Witte, but you know you can <laughs> whichever way is fine. Yeah. So and, and so the name of your firm is yeah. It's Witte House, uh, with the house being the German spelling, all smart. And uh, yeah, when I started it, somebody had told me, had said, hey, Toby, you should really market sort of you and your Germanness as part of what you bring to the table. And so um, the U URL wasn't taken, so I took it <laughs> and made it in nice. business name. <laughs> nice. It, uh, yeah, I, I love it, and I love the branding. And uh, so if, if you're not... Uh, if you're not familiar, um, you need to go to Toby's website and go to his, what's, what does it say on the website? Does it say swag or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Swag. Yeah. Yeah. So you can order a Vita house t-shirt, um, uh -huh. which I, I should have worn that today, but, uh, but, uh, get your Vita house t-shirt today. <laughs> yes. And if you have a baby, we even have a onesie for you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. I love that. I love it. Well, um, so first of all, congratulations. You published Supersizing Bliss. Um, tell me, tell us about Supersizing Bliss, you know, and, and, and the, the whole subtitle and everything. Why, why did you want to write this book with that title? What, uh, what was the inspiration for it? Yeah. Um, well, I would say that um, I had... I guess just one too many conversations with prospective clients where where the conversation would focus on pieces of the puzzle that just didn't seem that important to me. And, um, um, you know, lots, a lot of times it's the square feet, cost per square foot, um, all kind of metrics that just don't mean much to anybody really when you get down to it. And, you know, in these conversations, you have a minute to kind of try to change the the sort of um, tone of the entire conversation. And for me, and I, what I was thinking was that really I need to shift this conversation and start from a different foot. And if I just had a book that I could hand to my clients and say, hey, read this first, and then we can talk if you're still interested, then we would have an entirely sort of different conversation. And and. What my point is, is that if you go into creating a custom home for yourself, it's a lot of investment of time, money, just good mojo that has to go into it. And you do it probably once in a lifetime. You're going to do it so that you're going to feel good when once you live in there. It has to be a stage for your life. It has to be there to make you feel better about yourself, about your life. Um, and it has to be a trusting partner in this whole affair. And um, that's what the power is um, in good design. It's just to bring all that to the table. And so if we, if I can say, hey, let's not talk about supersizing square feet, but let's talk about supersizing the bliss, um, then we should be in a better place. So, yeah. 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 I, I love that. How, how are people receiving oh. the book, receiving the idea? Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it has been only, what now, a few weeks or so since it has been sort of out and available, but I have already one prospective client on uh, my blog post or answering on the blog post about the book and saying uh, uh, the, roughly something along the line that, oh my God, the, 
only bad thing about the book is that I can't put it down. And I want my architect to say exactly these things. This is this is what I'm thinking about. And I'm, so I was just like, I mean, that's right there. That was worth yeah. the whole whole endeavor just to hear that. And, and yeah, so I think it um, it's doing its job already. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It has actually. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say um, during the writing process, which was I don't know a year and a half or something, um, the entire process, I kept thinking I would have prospective client meetings, and I would think, "Oh my God, if I just had my book already, because that would—that's <laughs> what I was trying to—I'm trying to tell you here." But you know, it's a couple of chapters worth. Uh, I guess wait a year. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it just showed showed me that I was on the right track with it all. Well, yeah, I love I love the fact that really a, the ideas are generated from your experience working with clients, and now now you're packaging it up and, and giving it back to them, really, in, in the um, yeah you know in this form of a gift, um, and, and the focus on on bringing happiness back into the home. Um, I, I think probably as a result, but probably also as a as part of the process, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, mind-boggling to me how, how, and that's one half of the title, I guess, is how badly we have done in creating homes for ourselves and um, letting the sort of unbridled marketplace go rampant and provide mass-produced housing that is just awful. I mean, nobody should live in the houses we live in. Uh, and, um, so I forgot where I was going with this <laughs> but right. happiness, happiness. So yeah, the happiness part is, um, uh, it's sort of a no brainer, if you will, when the pandemic hit, uh, it turned out that nobody liked living in their houses. They suddenly, you know, everybody was suddenly forced to live at home and it sucked. Pardon my French, but it was just awful. Nobody liked it. Suddenly, everybody had to add on to their house and build pools and whatnot, and it was just ridiculous. And uh, it was just a testimony to that. You know, their our homes are basically good enough to sort of come home, watch you know watch Netflix, drink yourself to a stupor, and hope you wake up the next day. It's just no good, and uh, we just could lie about it. And so I think that the pandemic really showed us: no, I'm not happy in the house that I live in, and there should be a better way to do this. And that's what the house should be. We spend so much time in our homes that define how we greet the day, how we think about ourselves, and we have to do better. Yeah, yeah. I, I host a, a morning conversation, just a half hour every morning, and, and both Katie and Toby are, are regulars there. But it's it's all it's all about mindfulness and, and mindset. And you know, as you were saying that, I thought, yeah, I mean, it's we talk a lot in these, it's called Java with Jeff, it's our morning mindset conversation, but we talk a lot in those conversations about being present. And I, you know, I think that's something that we, we, you know, again, maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of us, um, we're just not, you know, we're, we're not focused on, on the moment. We're not focused on the, uh, the meaning. We're not focused on, on the feeling of, of right now. And, and, and being here and um, uh, that, that that whole series of conversations have been quite eye-opening to me because number one, I'm not qualified to host those conversations. I just learn, I learn enough to stay ahead of the conversation, but, but I, I completely understand where you're coming from there, right? It's, you know, the idea that, oh, well, square footage or cost per square foot or whatever, that doesn't, that doesn't translate into anything that actually has anything to do with my life or my experience or, or the moment that I'm in right now. Um, so I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad you're, you've written this. Yeah. And it's um, when you say that it's really uh, so much comes to mind for me. So the, you know, one of the sort of pieces of the conversations you have is about um, having sort of mindfulness practices, right? And mm -hmm. so, I don't know, some people meditate, and other people pray, whatever it might be, but it's exactly sort of what you're describing there where you can kind of find a pause and and reflect and, and just calm things down for a moment. And um, 
even though you're kind of trying to just let go of everything, including your surrounding. I think that, I mean, we are, I know that most of us here on the call today are architects. We are just made to, to provide, to create spaces where that is so easy. I mean, we have the tools in our bag to create spaces that just ask you, that just already puts you in a different state where you can calm down, where you can focus, where, uh, you know, things can just ease up. I like the, my favorite stories is I was, have been lucky enough to design and build a home for my family and I, and, uh, we moved in seven, sorry, five years ago, um, six years ago. And, uh, I, I mean, this is, we have, it still feels like we're on vacation. I mean, we walked in, my family couldn't wipe their smiles off their face for weeks. And we walk in here and all the stress we bring home from work and whatnot, it just walks away. It just falls away. There's, it's just, and it's literally because, you know, we created a stage where, where we can just relax and feel good and be appreciated and where this space, this environment sort of talks to us and, and, and makes us just feel at ease. And I mean, you know, it's incredible that we have these skills to create that. We have the toolbox and nothing should hold us back to, to do so. Yeah. So for everybody else out there who's listening to this, hire an architect. Um, uh, if you do your home, because you know it's they know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it you know I, I mentioned mischief maker earlier because that's that's one of my and you've been you've been doing this for a while, but it's one of my favorite things. I'll be I'll be scrolling through Instagram and I run across a Monday morning mischief, um, and I, I love those. First of all, starting with this idea of Monday morning mischief, but you're explaining. You're explaining all the aspects of, of design and, and living. Uh, can you tell us more about, you know, that that series that you? And yeah. by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's a very high quality uh, <laughs> video series that that Toby produces there. But but tell us more about Monday Morning Mischief. Yeah, it's it, the book kind of started with that series in some ways. Um, I just did exactly. So every uh, started every Monday morning, and now it's every other. Uh, week, I essentially, yeah, it's like a two, three, four minute short video where I just take one question of my clients or one thing that I'm working on or dealing with that I think it's interesting for my clients to to hear about, to just uh, put, uh, make it a you know, fun little story behind it and share it. And um, the, so uh, one of the comments on the book, um, it's the director of an ar architecture school he said that my book was sort of a love letter to architecture for, for people that are not architects, for non-architects. And so the, and I really love that because the Monday Morning Mischief series was really me trying to figure out how to talk to my clients. What do they want to hear? And it's, it's difficult. And Jeff, you at one point shared a story about a uh, brewery closing shop close by you. And uh, and it was interesting for me because it was, and you asked the question, what's the value of a $7 beer? You can go to the supermarket and buy a six or a six pack with it, the same price. And it was so easy for me to answer that question, right? It's like, well, so you have, I can imagine just the brewmaster who's all about the perfect beer and the taste and the ingredients and all that good stuff. And then you have the people who really want to go there because they get to have their whatever, when they get together, they run club meetings, what have you, there's a place to congregate, all of these things. The beer has to be good. If it's bad beer, they won't come. But that's not important, right? That just creates sort of the atmosphere for everybody to do what else they want to do. And for me to sort of think, oh, I have a million ideas about what the brewery should do to kind of uh, market themselves and help out and help, you know, sort of meet the brewmaster with his clients or, or her clients with their clients, is that was easy for me to see. In my own business, it's it's so difficult. And so, so with the Monday Morning Mischief series, I was trying to sort of like get out of my brewmaster, you know, thing and 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 sort of okay, let me just sort of. See answer the questions you ask me, talk about the things that are interesting to me that I love to talk about in a way that 
that I hope you might find interesting. So we can talk about something that, that you know you want to talk about talk about. And then sort of the book just grew out of it. One uh sorry for the long monologue, but one uh uh little video clip that got great sort of views is about me making the point that you can buy a school bus for literally the same price as a Maserati. And uh, and so the square foot price is so much better for the school bus. And, and so do you seriously, are you seriously walking into a car lot of a, you know, luxury car brand and say, sell me a school bus? Because that's what my clients used to do to me. They come in here and ask for a school bus. And for the it, it, it costs the same price. You can buy a school bus or you can buy as a Mater, Maserati and you want to just drive down to the beach and have a good time and you asking for the school bus makes no sense. And uh, and so that was a, one of those kind of stories that I have fun with and, and you know, the book kind of grew out, out of all of it. I love it. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline of when you started collecting your musings and when it started to become, okay, this is more than just a writing. This is something I can do with video. And then when did that like, oh, this can become a book? Because that's a fascinating progression of content creation. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure Jeff and Mark and the whole entry architect community was is at fault. Um, the idea Yeah, share to, the blame. <laughs> <laughs> to, exactly. <laughs> it's not my fault. So, um, but um, I don't know, it just, you know, it was part of the, I don't know, it was just a natural progression where, where these things were just piling up. And I think the format wasn't necessarily always the right one, I felt like, um, where I thought there's so much stuff here, I'm just pushing one thought, but it really, you know, in a book you have all of these thoughts sitting there and you get to just open read half a chapter chapter a couple sentences and put it away but it's still you know beckons you and okay let me read another page or something and so it has a longer shelf life and maybe kind of germinates in different ways um and and it just you know felt like the right progression however um i did take some writings blog posts and the video stuff and whatnot and said well let's put it together and start writing a book Turns out it's not a whole lot and you have to fill a lot of pages. And then I was sitting there and going, okay, so what do we do? <laughs> and in the process, wow. I learned a lot. It was incredible. I mean, I was just blown away with sort of these half notions and ideas that were sort of percolating that had no substance that I now got to sit down and say, okay, so what is the story behind it? Uh, the funniest thing is the very first chapter I wrote, I sat down and I realized, and started just writing sort of an introduction to my thoughts and I'm literally writing to build and design single family homes is ridiculous makes no sense they're they're just wrong we shouldn't do this and I was like great so my entire business is kaput there we go this is it <laughs> stop writing stop working doesn't make any sense um, and so just like that the entire book just had all of these surprises for me that had an immediate effect on on how I work and how I show up and how I think about my business, all of that. I almost think that we should be told, okay, before you start a business, write a book so you can kind of clarify what you're actually talking about, then start the business. <laughs> I feel like there's a yeah. lot of things that we start backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's pretty fascinating. You know, we, the more we talk about, you know, all the different aspects of the business of architecture, um, you know, here at, in uh, the Entree Architect community, and we're we're rolling out a master class next week um, that's going to introduce the Arc OS, the Architecture Operating System. Uh, the very first facet of that is is planning, um, and so we'll we'll have this uh, this master class from from um, I'll have to remember the name as I go, but but um, from from overwhelmed to operational, that's not it, but. But I think that's a fascinating idea. If, if you sat down and you wrote the book, you would you would jump ahead. I think fifteen spaces on the on the board game, right? Because it's it would force you to think through a lot of the things that many of us 
oh, you know, I'll, I'll figure that out as I go, or I'll figure that out, um, you, you know, down the road somewhere, or, or I have no idea what, what it is that I don't know, uh, which is a lot of us, uh, from overwhelmed to optimized. Thanks, Mark. Um, that's the master class that starts next week. Um, so I love that idea. Maybe, maybe we'll do that as a master class. Everybody <laughs> write a book this week. Uh, you can figure out your business. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, or was I just going to say the, uh, uh, oh, like one of the craziest things I read was, uh, wrote it in the book, uh, is that, uh, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but I think like 75% of all construction happens in the suburbs and only 2% of all build work includes an architect. That was mind blowing to me. It was a Harvard mm -hmm. study that figured that out. Uh, that was just mind blowing to me. And, and the kind of, uh, effect that had on my business planning, you know, was incredible just to realize, just to look at that and, and sort of take that in. Yeah. There were fascinating, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, pulling this out of my head here, but there's, uh, there were some fascinating numbers, uh, census numbers I dove in for a minute and found out and realized that sort of there is our uh, living arrangements are so faceted and so complex and different and varied uh, and it changed over the years and that sort of this single family home I don't know four, three bedrooms a living room a kitchen dining room and all of that cannot be a fit to all of these people in their different ways of living and yet that is sort of what we still um kind of carry around with us and people come and say okay i guess i want a house that's what it should offer and it makes no sense whatsoever that's yeah. the reference uh katie about the ladies journal uh we talked about earlier that those age old uh journals still they have such a long lag time we still carry that around the houses that we now sell house plans we sell online they're exactly the same as a hundred years ago in these uh, ladies journals or whatever they were called that you shared some of it, Katie, earlier, that are just so like, what what age is this? This is like, what kind of dusted old history books is this? It makes no sense in today's parlance, ideas, understanding of the world whatsoever. And we still, but the house plants we sell has, haven't changed a bit. I think that's <laughs> what I really appreciated about your book in that reading just reading a summary of it that you go back to the structure of a home you go back to the essential elements and you talk about that structure briefly about how um you're connecting to your home and your home is how you connect or you're also connecting with the outside world in ways um i just wanted to note janine um that she felt like if she actually waited until she felt like she started her business uh she never would have started um so sometimes we have to dive in, uh, not knowing if we're ready, but I, the same is true for people starting to build a house. They don't want to dive in until they know what they're getting into. And I like that, um, you, you're trying to outline that to help them imagine the full process, both in your website, through the series, you, you have the simple steps all the way to moving into the house, um, starting with, uh, the plan, talk to the architect and then getting property. And, and you do a nice job of uh, outlining that. How has um, how has this uh, study into writing the book really enhanced your process and changed conversations? I, ideally, people are going to come to you with this different mindset. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so as you're sort of, it's good to hear you describing that because I'm trying to create, how should I frame this? So um the uh you, okay <laughs> you talked about the structure or uh, certain uh, straightforward elements in architecture that we use that our clients have never heard about have no understanding we talk to ourselves as architects we build our websites for each other um Yet our clients, they look at us with big eyes and they go, so so tell me, how does this work? What is the first step? What do we do? What do I have to ask? All of these questions. And so I've been trying to provide that to them, to filter everything that I want to do in terms that they want to hear, need to hear, 
answer their questions. And um, sounds like you're so, learning to do architecture again. Yeah, hundred percent, totally, and better for it, right? Because suddenly I'm listening to my audience, right? I mean, you know, it's it's uh, becomes a yeah. Together you create this, and you get to meet together and see this thing develop. And so, yeah, I mean the conversations have changed the um way we talk to each other has changed my clients come to me now and they trust me in fact this entire process that you sort of outlined there is meant to or, or give those the opportunity to walk away they need to walk away uh that way we're just not a good fit but for those that say oh toby that's what i want you to do what i want to see we get to talk and so they so so now they come to me and they trust me they they want me to guide them through the process listen to them but but so they there is already that they walk in the door and they say i've already i already know you toby and i've never met him before that's the craziest actually part about the the video series where people come up to me, hey Toby, I want to talk to you. It's like I'm going through my brain. Okay, who's this? Have I talked to them before? What is it? Trying to you know Google who I don't know, uh, and uh, then they tell me, oh, I saw you on the video online. It's like okay, and they tell me all their darkest and deepest secrets, you know. So it is it has really helped um, the all of that. And you're right. Uh, architecture has changed i do i work differently now i'm i'm unbridled i get to they they look at me and we established up front a lot of stuff uh, the entire sort of laundry list of their wishes and ideas and square feet and price all of that is important stuff we talk about the technical parts and and all of the all of that but but then now that i know that i'm not i have already talked to them so much in all of this process, they know where I'm coming from, what I'm talking about, what is, what I think I can, how I can enrich their lives, that I now don't hold back, but instead get to just sort of do it and do it right and expect that I will knock their socks off and I have to do even better because we already, I already promised all of that. Um, and is it, so it's changing what I do. Is any of that change in practice, uh, change from practicing in Germany and then practicing in America? Christian had a great question about uh, how how is it different uh, other than the metric system? And then he also <laughs> wanted to know if Germans are more blissful than Americans. Uh, oh, he's going to get me in trouble. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's in his intent, uh, yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, people, so yes, I worked in Germany. I started there, uh, but um, I have... So I had a lot of culture shocks going back and forth over the years, has been many years. And um, it turns out people are the same everywhere. Um, same problems, same concerns, same things. But some things are of course different as far as the bliss is concerned. Um, Germans are not necessarily known for having the greatest lifestyle. I don't know, Italians might be more top of the list, but in Europe, the you know, a lot of these things kind of float over the borders. And so there is more of a sense of um, enjoying what you do uh, uh, that um, people want here just the same. Um, I think it's sometimes easier to, to get to over there than here. And um, I had to write a book here. <laughs> just kidding. No, but uh, yeah, so it's really very similar. The practice is different. Uh, they spend way more money in Germany. When I walk over there, I'm just sort of flabbergasted at seeing the quality of construction. It's just phenomenal. And I don't understand who pays for it, whether it's private or public endeavors. It's just nuts. And um, yeah, it's way different here. And so, I mean, as part of what I'm trying to express in the book is that to spend the money on the right quality, the qualities that matter. We had a... Uh, mastermind group earlier today here part of this uh, network and uh jack barnes one of the architects there he tells told a great story visiting uh, venice eating a meal at a restaurant and they were only sorry jack if i'm telling your story wrong but if you're listening in but but how they had one uh, the, the, the cook essentially told the guests what what's being served today and what wine gets paired with what food and the moment he sort of 
piped up and said, well, I don't want to have the whatevers with the whatevers. He was basically, you know, no, that's not how it works here. Um, we tell you what to cook. And he says, well, that was one of my best meals I've ever had, right? I can still remember what it was like. And and there was an expert telling Jeff, don't tell me you what to cook and what to pair it with. I'm telling you, and you're going to walk away with bliss and happiness. And, and so um, architects should do the same thing. That's interesting. Sorry, Jeff, I have one more question that ties this, yeah. that, that idea that American walks in and has that comment. You use the word supersize in your title, <laughs> which all I can think is that documentary Supersize Me and McDonald's yeah. and like, we always want it bigger and better. And yet you're, you're almost uh, misleading people reading your book because you're talking about supersized bliss, but it's not going to be a supersized home necessarily. Yes, exactly right. I had, so maybe that came, I had one prospective client talking to me who said, hey, I have this chunk of money. Here's all of these things I want to do. And I said, and, and so I said, okay, what you're listing up here is about 8,000 square feet. That'll cost you four times as much as you have. Now, if you want to get what a house for what you do can pay, what you can pay for, it's going to be around 3,000 square feet. And he look, looks at me and says, Toby, you want me to live in a tiny home? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was thinking, 3,000 square feet for two people? That's not a tiny home. So, yeah, if you're talking about supersizing something, then, you know, supersize the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I love that approach. I love the twist, as you know. And, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that um, I was as you were talking, I was trying to remember who I heard say this. I'm pretty sure it was on some sort of social media. It might have been Chris Doe, who I bring up quite a bit. But the, the gist of the conversation was essentially the more you talk with and listen to, you know, and that for this audience, it would be clients, the people that you serve, however you want to say that, the, the, you know, the more time you spend with them, the better you're going to be at what you do, the more satisfied they're going to be, and the more they're going to trust you. And that's, that's one of the things that you said earlier, and it doesn't surprise me at all, right? Because you spent all of this time uh, just sort of absorbing what these clients are saying and, and then um, really focusing on presenting this information back to them in their language, you know, so that they understand it. And, and uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that it's driving a lot of, a lot of trust and, and recognition, you know, Hey, Toby, uh, so you've got to be careful. You may want to start wearing a disguise when you're out in public, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I, I think, I think that's something that we can all, we can all learn from, you know, whether you're starting your own thing or, or, um, maybe you've been at it for 10 or 12 years or whatever it is, the more we listen to these, these people that we serve, the better everything is going to be. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, that's yeah. uh, I think it's also a lot of the, at the core of the entry architect sort of communities uh, mantra, if you will, if there is one, uh, at least a lot of the, what I've learned is sort of around that. Um, and so, um, yeah. Totally agree with that, and I mean, so I see the, I see, I see it in front of me. I see the change in the conversations I have and the work I do. It's incredible. Yeah. John Jones says he's definitely going to have to uh, buy the book. So if if uh, you're like John, go to supersizingbliss.com. The URL is in the bottom left hand corner of the screen right now, um, and you can order the book there. And. Uh, uh, start to enjoy it. What's one of your, what's one of your favorite uh, stories or, or favorite uh, pieces of advice in the book? Oh, good one. I should have been prepared for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much good stuff in there. I have to say I had to read the book several times during the editing process and everything that at the, you know, um, teens time I was like, I don't, I can't, not again. I hate every last word in it. So I pick it up and I'm, I just get, I'm reading it and I'm, oh man, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is beautiful. I end up reading this whole thing front to back. I'm like, this is good stuff. <laughs> so 
there's probably hopefully a lot of good things in there. Uh, well, one personal story is that I don't know if I can tell this story that well um, in person, but so when we design our home here, we have three daughters and um, they're sort of two years apart and love each other most of the time. And uh, uh, so we designed a house where the their rooms, they have three rooms, each one of their own room. They're 12 by 15 feet, kind of standard, but we arranged them in sort of this um, flower pad uh, petal kind of uh, pattern where each, each room sticks out from the other one. And so each room has windows on three sides. And these windows are from floor to ceiling. And otherwise, it's just a boring room but for each of them, but they, they all meet at the center of this flower with three doors all next to each other. And so what happens is that they get to be aware of their sisters next to each other. And the windows are arranged in a way that you can't really look into the room. You just see sort of the edge, the corner of a room. And so you see the light go on and turn off. You see the shadow of the other sister there. Um, and you're always aware of them, but you have your own privacy. And so, so I'm sharing the book is how you, you know, they, we, they, we get to be together as a family. We get to, you know, sh share meal. They have great conversations and they get to hate each other for a moment, right? Like sisters do storm up, slam the door on the room, but it can only last that long before, you know, the, you know, the apology, the light turns on, you know, the sister's there. You don't hate me that much, right? It's there. And and I really think that it has changed the way we, they live together over the last, it has influenced their relationship to each other. Of course, you know, it's I can't sort of say, well, architecture has that big of an influence that, you know, uh, solves all sins, but, but, I do think that it had it had a positive and a very specific influence of how they grow up, how we live as a family, and how we sort of think of each other. So that's just one story of I don't know what twenty four chapters or something. <laughs> I love it. Um, I also have three daughters, and two of them share a room right now. But the four year old mm -hmm. keeps trying to crawl into the bunk bed of the six year old, and she's yep. like, "No, I need my own space." Uh huh. And so it's great to see how that's celebrated in the design. I am yeah. curious what your opinions are on spaces with a dedicated purpose versus multi-use space. Because yes. Because that seems to be a new, like, big floor plan open. And that's a terrible simplification yeah. of the conversation. But how do you approach the dedication of space versus the multitude of uses in a space? That's a great question. Um, so... To your point, I think that sort of free floor plans are being thrown around without much thinking. It's essentially the same floor plan from the journal, Ladies Journal magazine, except you just take the walls out, but nothing changes. Um, and, and, and another problem is that people talk about sort of flexible space by having movable elements. People don't move things. People don't have the desk fold down and then clear it up and then fold it back in. Doesn't happen. And so how? They, so the question is, well, how do you do that? Also, to my point earlier, how our life living arrangements are so varied and change and you know constant flux. Can a house adjust to those needs, whatever it might be? And so, I think the trick is to provide. Um, to not to talk about, the short of it might be, to put it that way, is um, don't talk about floor plans, don't talk about walls, lines on the drawing, talk about spaces. And so if you, even the most free and open floor plan should have space, should be made up of different spaces that have different qualities to it. And so I talk in the book about sort of some key qualities with which we get to design the houses we live in or create architecture and that we have to our disposal. We can use these elements to create different feelings, different senses, different spaces. And so we know all of that, that language, right? I mean, so a, a, a harshly said, but to make a point, like a prison cell feels like a prison cell because of what it is, right? A, a, a grand, the grandeur of a cathedral has, it imbues us with a certain sense and has a certain effect. 
we can come to our, the design of our houses in the same way. And if you take an open floor plan, have have niches, have areas, have places that are just feel different just because of this, the, how we create the space within a free, uh, a free flo a flowing floor plan. So that, I think that's the basis of the trick. So like in our house, for instance, it's all one open floor plan, if you will, downstairs, um, but it changes, like the privacy changes just because of our range where at the beginning is wide open and the further you go, the more private it gets, even though um, it's really one open floor plan, if you will. And so you have an ability to, 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 to shut off, to change, to, to, have a moment for yourself, have a moment with two people, have a moment with four people, have a, pop, a moment with your spouse, with your kid, with your grandparent, where it's, every time it's a different kind of atmosphere situation that has to have a different space and a different way we get together. And so if a space is able to do that, where I have our kitchen dining room table right here because it's the five of us, but 10 years from now it's over there, and smaller because it's two of us and something else happens over here. If a house is able, if a building is able to provide spaces with different qualities, then I think it's a, you know, a recipe for success. I'm thinking a little bit like the shared office spaces. They work really hard on doing that where they have constantly changing clients with different needs. And so all of the spaces within shared office spaces often have sort of these different qualities so that you can address different people at different times with different options. You flowed right into Mark's question about how this same mentality of design can be applied to other spaces that architects design, including yeah. work. But I think Mark also that uh, work is now included in the home. Yeah. <laughs> Please into <laughs> it. Well, I think the basic, I mean, I think the basic to my book it is about single family homes, but the basics is ask yourself what you want out of your building and out of your house. Forget all about what you think you've learned so far and start with this clean slate. Forget the market forces. Understand it's art that you're you're asking for and and then dive in and trust the process. And so that can be applied to to any any space and whatever it might be. When you ask these questions, this is the same questions again, not to <laughs> make this an infomercial for Entree Architect, but that's the same question the network asks of us as professionals to do for our business. Ask the same questions. Um, don't take the status quo, but look at what you're doing, what you want out of it, what your vision is what you're dreaming of and and then make everything work towards that goal and start start from scratch and don't just sort of result to the bottom drawer okay we got a plan for that here it is next one no good comes from that yeah do you have good yeah. ways to keep that goal present throughout the design process i literally part of the book came so there's four parts in the book where I speak specifically more sort of architectural stuff, which I talk about structure. I talk about um, light and shadow, I talk about space, and then I talk about texture. Those four things are literally, I have essentially a running document for each project. And I, it has a baseline that is, has developed over the years that is sort of at the beginning that I just trying to remember things that I need to communicate, things, steps we have to go through, all of that. On the very top were those four pieces that I had put there for me to remember, never to forget whatever weeds we get lost into, that I can always find my way back to daylight and look at that and go, all I need to do is is, is create, you know, look at the structure and make it meaningful and, and sort of really sexy so that the space really benefits from it and how we live in it and how we feel in it. Same with this, just the quality of the space. I bring up Maya Lin's mem uh, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. Gives me goosebumps every time I'm there. I have no relationship to their war whatsoever. I walk down there and I'm just, I want to lay down and ball and cry. It's, and it's just a physical space. So I talk about that. I talk about the texture. Brick walls ought, ought to be inside. They bring such richness to a living environment. Um, and and the light and shadow. I talk about it all the, in the book. I talk about that to my clients all the time. It's front and center, and I keep it there 
keep in my mantra so that when I concentrate on that, only good can comes out of it. And it's for the benefit of my clients. Even if they come to me and talk to about square feet, I get to say, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your happiness and here's some ways how we can sort of get there quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. And so Mark asked another question that's, you know, I've been trying to figure out how to wrap not so big house into this conversation. Um, so Mark asked, what can we do to take your message from the book and make it a consumer movement like not so big house was or, or is um, the not so big house type of movement? So homeowners know that there is a better, healthier, happier way. Um, You're right. Made, we, all, we all feel so small compared to the big builders. At least I do. Um, they yeah. seem to have so much of the market right now and so much capacity to convince yeah. people they're the right option. So how do we show this alternative? Well, I don't know if this is... Well, I, I got uh, 300 million copies of my book upstairs. If every American <laughs> reads it, we're good to go. All right, John <laughs> Jones, you can uh, order in bulk. <laughs> That's right. But uh, this might not be quite an answer, but uh, in lieu of an answer, you're asking me too much. Uh, but um, this morning I was thinking, you know what we need? We need construction loans. We need design loans so that people can actually finance architects, designers properly upfront for the entire time that it takes to design a house. They can, so that, and, 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 and that the value is recognized by banks uh, the same way that, we, that they do it for the actual construction piece so that we no longer talk about what banks want to talk about, what ginormous builder or developers talk about, but talk about actually what we, what the and consumers, I mean by that the consumers of homes, what we actually desire. And what we need for that is architects, designers that do their job well, and we need to be able to pay them well and right so that they have the time and capacity to answer those questions and give to their clients what they need to give. And if we had, I don't know, design loans in some fashion, maybe that would do the trick. Yeah. You hit a yeah. tone there. That's resonating. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've thought that for a long time. It's if, if we, if we want to argue that architects should be designing homes, the, the big gap, right. Is that, you know, it doesn't matter if your client wants to build a, a $300,000 or $3 million home if their budget is 300 or 3 million, you still are tacking on what some percentage on top of that. You know, if, if you're doing a percent of construction type contract, they can, they can finance everything essentially, except for what you're tacking onto it. And that's that in this rampant consumerism um, environment that we're in, that's, that's a really hard thing for consumers to to swallow and to come up. Oh, I've got to come up with an extra, you know, if it's ten percent, I've got to come up with an extra uh, three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for my for my home, um, just because I want an architect to design it. I'm not I'm not devaluing architects or their fees. It's just that's a huge problem, right? That's a huge gap right there. I think you're exactly right. There's there needs to be some sort of financial mechanism. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but um, you know maybe one of my students will will do that as uh, as one of in the grad class um, as a, a concept of what, what would it be? It'd be like a design. Uh, let's see, what would it be fin fin design design fin type project? Yeah, um, come up with an idea for that. That would be fantastic. I and mean, we come to think of it, the. Um, so it's painful to see when when I have clients who turn around for personal reasons and sell the house and it gets that I design and spend two years sort of helping them create, you know, come to fruition and they sell it for an enormous upcharge of the actual costs. It was already expensive per square foot for the as far as banks are concerned to make it happen. The moment they turn around and sell it, there's a line out down the road and everybody's happy to spy that, you know, outbid each other. And that actually is the value that we as architects just brought in 
And so for banks should be able to say, okay, I gladly pay for that because that means that my investment into this house is going to be more than secure because everybody would want that. And by the time it sells, it sells for a multiple. Yeah. Should be easy. Yeah, yeah it's definitely, it's, it's repositioning value somehow. Um, you know, it, the, there'll have to be a tipping point, obviously, to, to drive that. But uh, I think you're really onto something there. And hopefully less insurance claims because of yes. proper detailing and observation during construction. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're cracking the nut on something here. That's good. <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> we're solve some problems here. Well, I know we're we're almost to the top of the hour here. Um, so uh, this has been first of all, thank you to everyone for coming back on a new day and and new time, um, new look, new co-host, new new everything here. So uh, appreciate everybody showing up at uh, for for this reboot of Context and Clarity Live. And Toby, of course, congratulations on Supersizing Bliss. Congrats on publishing the book. And uh, thank you for sharing uh, the, the stories and, and also the impact of it. Uh, I think, you know, it, it did take a lot, right, to write the book, but, um, but there's a lot coming from it. So I think, uh, I think that's a good lesson for all of us. Um, looking forward to next week, next Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. We will have, uh, as our guest for Context and Clarity Live, Ryan Frederick. Somebody may go, hmm, that name sounds familiar. Well, Ryan Frederick was the closing keynote at the Entree Architect Community Annual Meeting in Austin last uh, November. And he is the, the uh, founder and CEO of HERE. <laughs> so he, he rebranded. He told us in November that, that he was in the process of rebranding, but he is in he is the founder and CEO of here. So we're going to talk to Ryan next week. It's going to be a fascinating conversation, just like it was uh, back in November. Uh, he's going to focus on aging and, and living. Um, uh, so it, it, this is something for not just architects, but for all of us who, who live in communities, uh, which kind of opens it up to everybody, I guess. Uh, so join us next week at 2 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. For that conversation with Ryan. Again, uh, Toby, thank you for this conversation. Katie, thank you for being a great co-host today. This has been a lot of fun. And um, to everybody out there, again, thanks for thanks for following us over here. Um, I'm going to close this the same way that we used to. Please be well and stay safe. Keep those around you safe and well. Take a little bit of time to breathe, relax, uh, find some way to rejuvenate. We don't do context and clarity every day anymore, but um, I'm learning more and more. You know, breathing and relaxing and rejuvenating is important every day, no matter what. So uh, thanks for coming along this journey with us, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.